If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at chapters 6, 7, and the first part of 8. Let me make four preliminary remarks before we jump into the text of Scripture. First, some of you may know the last time I preached in this pulpit, I preached for 30 minutes from one verse. Now, I know after looking at all of Revelation 6, 7, and the first part of 8, you're probably thinking, how long is this going to last? Well, I calculated it for you. I've done the math. In all these verses, compared to the one verse that I preached on the last time I was here, it's going to take about 19 hours, 39 minutes, and 17 seconds. Seriously, though. Revelation is a great study in which to look at thematically, and that's what we're going to be doing together. Secondly, in light of all these verses, picture, if you will, that we're boarding a helicopter, and we're going to fly up over the terrain of this text a few hundred feet and look at it from a very high-level view. We're at no time going to have time to land the chopper, get out, put boots on the ground, and look at anything with any specificity. But there are some times we're going to be able to come down at a lower altitude and look at something a little bit more closely because we're going to find some really interesting things, some fascinating things in this text when we fly over it together. Here's what I hope you'll do is you'll go back on your own at another time and read through this text and put your very own boots on the ground. Third preliminary remark I want to make to you before we jump into the Word of God is this, is we've got to have a doctrinal construct in our mind when we look at a book like the book of Revelation or any biblical text for that matter. See, there's this lie that exists out there today where people say, oh, we don't need doctrine. It divides. We just all need to love Jesus. Can I just honestly say to you as a brother in Christ, don't buy into that. That is literally like going to the store, buying a bucket with a hole in it. It doesn't hold water. It doesn't work. We need doctrine. Doctrine, in one sense, does divide, and the reason is because truth divides. Doctrine actually brings us to the point that we know which Jesus the Bible is telling us about, which Jesus we are to worship. And so when we look at this, here is a construct of doctrine for us to consider when we study a passage like we're looking at today. First of all, there are these first-tier, first-order, non-negotiable doctrines. If you were to come to me and you were to say, I don't believe in salvation by grace, or I don't believe in the deity of Christ, by the authority of God's word, I can look at you and say, you're not a Christian. And then there's these second-order doctrines. For example, I have learned a lot from people that I differ with on the view of spiritual gifts and baptism. Now, those doctrines are so significant that they impact what we do on a Sunday morning. I still see those people as brothers and sisters in Christ. We just choose to go to a different fellowship. And then there are those third order, third tier doctrines. And the book of Revelation has a lot of those contained in it. It's a great example of this. We might hold to a different view today of how the timeline of events are going to happen here in Revelation 6, 7, in the first part of eight. But in light of that, we can still see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can still serve in the same fellowship, and we can simply, in love, disagree in that area. And then fourthly and finally, I just simply pray the Lord's going to use this time in the book of Revelation to do two things, to comfort us with his word, but also to confront us with his word. So I pray that I will share and you will receive this text of scripture with much humility today. So with no further ado, let's do jump in the word of God together. And if you're taking notes, we're going to be looking at this from the chopper a couple hundred feet up, looking over the terrain, finding those themes. And the first theme that we see that we're going to come down at a lower level to take a look at is this. Number one, the scroll. The scroll. And this involves us looking back into chapter 5 from last week just for a moment. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 tells us this. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. See, a scroll at this time was just a long piece of papyrus or animal skin. And it was stitched together horizontally because it was easier to ride on, but it was also easier to roll up from both ends into the middle. And this is what this scroll looks like. It is rolled up, which presents a problem for us. 
We have a scroll, but it is closed. We want to find out the content of this scroll, but we can't get to it. So the question is, who can open this scroll so that we can find out what is inside of the scroll? And that brings us to the next theme that we see from this text. Number one, the scroll, but number two, the sovereign. Revelation chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, we see here John sees this angel and the angel is there and he's asking, is anyone worthy to open the scroll? I want you to notice, no one in heaven speaks, no one on earth speaks, and no one in hell speaks. No one anywhere at any time, any place speaks. The most celestial beings in the presence of the Lord, they don't say a word. The great heroes of our faith who have come before us, they don't say a word, including John, does not answer. We find out there's no one worthy to open the scroll. And as a result, John begins to weep because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Then in verse 5, one of the elders tells John, weep no more. In other words, stop crying because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. You see, there's only one worthy to open the scroll. It's the sovereign. It's the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can take this scroll as the sovereign and open it because of his characteristics and his accomplishments, because of who he is and what he has done. And the rest of chapter 5, as we have read, details his worthiness. See, the scroll that Christ is going to take and he's going to open, it's literally like a title to the universe. The difference is Christ is not going to open this title and find out the inheritance that he's received. No, he's going to open it and take back with force what is already rightfully his. So how does the sovereign open the scroll? Well, that brings us to the third theme of the text, which we're going to spend the most time on, the seals. It is the seals. Verse 1 and verse 5 tell us of chapter 5, that this particular scroll that we're looking at, it is sealed with seven seals. Now, seven seals on a scroll, that was common in the Roman world. And scrolls were sealed up for various reasons. One was to prevent people from getting inside of them and tampering and seeing the contents that were rolled up inside of the scroll. So you had to have the authority to break the scroll and get into the contents. So we've established Christ is the only one with the authority as the sovereign to break the seals on the scroll and get inside to the content. So here's what lays ahead for us in these chapters. We're going to see the sovereign taking the scroll and breaking each one of the seven seals. And the contents of the scroll, as each seal is broken, it's going to show the judgments that are going to take place here on earth during the tribulation period. You know, this year will mark 20 years that my wife Katie and I, we've been married. Now, I'm not making any connection between living with me and the tribulation period. You can make your mind up on that. But I do remember what happened to us 17 years ago. 17 years ago, this weekend, she woke me up about 3 a.m. And she said, Brad, it's time. I was very groggy, and, and I rolled over, and I knew exactly what she meant. But I asked a pregnant woman the very worst thing that you could ask her at 3 a.m. when she says it's time. I said, are you sure? And so we loaded up the car and we drove to the hospital. And from 3 a.m. until 5.32 p.m. that afternoon, she was in labor until the Lord finally blessed us with our daughter, Emily Grace. Now, during the time leading up to the birth, the pain got worse and worse and worse. And that was just for me. I know it was really bad for her until Emily finally appeared. See, this is what's reflected a bit in the tribulation and in the end of time. Jesus tells us in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, which parallels the tribulation here in Revelation. Matthew 24, verse 8 says, All these are but the beginnings of birth pains. See, it's going to get more and more intense with each seal as it is broken like birth pains and contractions, not until the baby appears, but until Christ appears. So if you're following along in the scriptures, turn with me to chapter 6, and let's see what happens when Christ breaks the first seal. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 to see what is inside of this first seal. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the first seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. 
And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. You see, when Christ breaks the first seal, here's what John sees is a white horse with a rider. Now, we're going to see in the next three seals three more horses and their riders for a total of four, which we know to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This rider, notice he's wearing a crown and he's carrying a bow. Now, some have thought, well, this has got to be Christ, because if you compare what is happening in Revelation 19, there are some similarities. But this is not Christ here for a couple of reasons. One, he's opening the scrolls. He just broke the first seal of this scroll. But secondly, when you look at Revelation 19, he's not carrying a bow. He's carrying a sword. When you look at Revelation 19, Christ there, he's not wearing one crown. He's wearing many crowns. So this is not Christ. This is more likely the Antichrist. And notice the white horse here. What does that bring to mind? White, a white flag for peace. See, the Antichrist is coming with a bow in his hand on a white horse. And a bow is a symbol of war. But what does he not have here in the text? He has no arrows. And so it tells us that his victory is won by deceit, not by weapons of war. If you were to study the book of Daniel, particularly in verse 27, we're brought to the 70th week of Daniel. These are seven-year periods that prophetically unfold. And right now we're between the 69th and the 70th week. And that 70th week, those final seven years, is what's unfolding here in the tribulation. And we see from Daniel 9, the Antichrist falsifies peace with this covenant. And the point here is the tribulation is going to begin with just that, fake false, a facade of peace. People are going to let their guard down and it's the perfect environment for the Antichrist to assume and take authority and control. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 11 tells us people are going to be duped by this. They're going to fall for this false peace, which is going to give way to judgment that you're going to see take place in the second seal. So if you will, look at verses 3 and 4 and see what happens when Christ breaks the second seal. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So when Christ breaks the second seal, we don't see a white horse this time. We see a red horse with its rider appear. And this rider is given not a bow, but he actually is given a great sword. Now the Greek word here for sword is moharath. Now, why is that significant? Well, that's the exact type of sword that a Roman soldier would carry into battle when he came to -to hand-to-hand combat. That tells us something about this sword. This sword was designed for one thing, to kill, to slay, to slaughter. And the symbols of the sword and the red horse, it's pointing us to a time of war and bloodshed. If we were to look back at the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, Jesus tells us there's going to be a time of wars and rumors of war. Think of unrest in the streets. You think of conflict. That's what wraps up here in the second seal, and that's what comes undone during the tribulation. The first seal brings us false peace. The second seal will bring global war, and then as a result, what is the third seal going to bring? Let's look at verses five and six. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So Christ breaks the third seal here, and we've seen a white horse and red horse, and this time we see a black horse and its rider. Now there's some language in here we have to pull out from the text to look at a bit more closely, but it says a quart of wheat... Now, that's just barely enough food to sustain one person for a day. It also mentions a denarius, and that's simply a day's wage for the average worker during this time. And the point that John wants us to see is it's going to take the average person's paycheck to get the bare minimum of food to survive. And you see another thing mentioned here. If you have a family during this time, you might be able to purchase three quarts of barley with your day wages. Now, the problem is barley didn't have the nutritional value that wheat did, and it was often given to animals instead because it was much cheaper. But that's the bare minimum you're going to be able to get with your day wages just to feed your family. 
You also see reference here oil and wine. That could take on a couple different meanings, but one that's pretty consistent in studying this text is these are staples. You needed oil to cook. You needed wine to disinfect your water. And the point is this. It's emphasizing to us that at this time, necessities are going to feel like luxuries. Felt just a small bit of that when you're snowed in and you're out of bread and milk and you have no water, you have no electricity. In this time, it's going to be magnified even worse than we can imagine. It could lead to price gouging. It could lead to food lines. As you see the color black, the pair of scales in the writer's hands, and just the language in this passage is symbolic of a worldwide famine that's to come. So we've seen this false peace with the first seal. We've seen these wars that break out in the second seal. In the third seal here, we see famine, which brings us to verses 7 and 8, as this culminates together like birth pains and contractions to the fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beast of the earth. See, Christ breaks the fourth seal, and this time a pale horse with its rider shows up. Now, pale here is significant because it's from the Greek word chloros. And when we think about that, we get the English word chlorophyll, which brings to mind a yellowish, greenish, grayish color, which then cannot help but bring our minds to something like a decomposing corpse. Now, why would I say that? Well, the text is just filled with that kind of language here in the fourth seal. Because notice this writer, unlike the others, he's actually identified. What is his name there? It's death. And this writer is actually given authority to kill over a fourth of the earth. That's 25%. If that happened at this moment, you're looking at a billion and a half to two billion people that would perish. I mean, that is staggering to consider. Do you see the pattern? We have the sword and famine from this text that happen in those second and third seals. But you also notice here it says pestilence and wild beast. What would this mean? Well, pestilence is a very broad word here in the fourth seal. Some commentators believe this could be chemical warfare. Some believe it could be diseases. I can tell you, don't read anything into this. This is not COVID. This is not anything happening at this moment. But this is severe epidemics and pandemics. And it says wild beasts. Now, you wouldn't think of something like a tiger or a lion roaming around the earth contributing to the death of 25% of the population. There's some commentators, and it makes sense, who believe that this could actually be a rat. In a war-torn environment, rats would be right to multiply and populate, and they carry many, many diseases. And you can see this historically. But regardless of what it is, you see this fourth seal. It's getting worse and worse as it builds upon the last one, which leads to the next one, the fifth seal. But it's a bit different than the others. It's a beautiful passage of Scripture in verses 9, 10, and 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were given a white robe, told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Now in verse 9 here, do you see what John sees? He sees there at the altar, those slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. It's incredible in the midst of what's happening in the second, third, and fourth seals that God is going to draw and do his work of salvation in the tribulation period. There are going to be people who are saved and come to Christ and hold fast to the word of God and witness of that truth that is inside of them, and they're going to be persecuted. And we see here in the fifth seal persecution for the believers in Christ during the tribulation. You see them here in heaven. And notice there in verse 10 what they're crying out for. They're asking the Lord a question. How long before you judge? How long before you avenge the blood of our persecutors, all those who dwell on the earth? Now I want you to notice this is not from a heart of revenge. They're not wanting God to go get these guys. They want God to prevail in his righteousness and justice. Now look at what the Lord does for them in verse 11. He simply closed them. He tells them to rest. See, God says, I'm going to answer this, but not in your time. 
in mind. Just wait, just rest. And that brings to close the fifth seal onto the opening of very dramatic sixth seal, which is going to get dramatically more intense, intense, and intense. We're going to look at verses 12 through 17 to see what happens when the sixth seal is broken. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when being shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the rocks of mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? To notice here in the first five seals, God is actually using human actions to accomplish his ordained plan. God is using the actions of humans to bring about his judgment and wrath. We see this all throughout the Bible. God uses the decisions of humans to bring about his plan. But we also see God occasionally doing what he's beginning to do here in the sixth seal. There's no humans involved. It is direct divine judgment from God directly to the earth. In other words, no human could accomplish the things that are happening here in the sixth seal. These are ramifications that are cataclysmic and cosmic. Look in verse 12. This includes a great earthquake. Now, I've never been through an earthquake. I remember sitting in my apartment when I was in seminary in Fort Worth, and I felt a small tremor when I was studying on the couch one night. And I wondered, was that an earthquake? Well, it turned out it actually was a very small earthquake. You're not going to have to wonder what this is. This is probably going to be an earthquake of global and epic proportions. And as a result here, notice in the text, it says, the sun became black and the full moon became like blood. You actually see this referenced in the Old Testament. Joel 2 and Isaiah 13 make reference to the sun and moon changing. An earthquake like this could literally cause volcanic eruptions that would send dust and ash into the air. And so when you look up, it would change the appearance of the sun and the moon. That might happen, or the Lord, of course, he could simply just change them directly himself if he so chooses to do so. Look at verse 13. It says, stars of the sky fell down to the earth. This could be a massive asteroid shower. This could be a meteor shower. It talks about like fig trees falling with a gale. In other words, a big gust of wind on a ripe fig tree would make the fig trees fall with such ease. I remember walking through a downtown street after a rain, and my daughter was walking ahead of me, and she walked under this tree. I reached up, and I just slapped the limb, and of course all the water fell down directly on her. She was not happy with me, but it fell with such ease Well, the same thing's going to happen as these fig trees would fall off a tree with ease. These stars are going to fall out of the sky with such ease. And it's a reminder to us. When we look up in the sky, we see things like the sun and the moon and the stars. They mark time for us. Well, as these things stop functioning how they should, we're reminded the end of time is upon us. It is coming. And with stars falling and the sun and moon changing, it brings darkness. And in Scripture, darkness is associated with judgment. And how fitting it is for things to be dark as the Lord is unleashing his fury and judgment upon the earth. Look at verse 14. We see massive changes in the earth. Things that we really can't even understand and describe here. One close reference I believe that could help us bring some light to this is actually in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, what you do is you see God judging the earth through the great flood. Now, I'm a literal six-day creationist. I don't believe the earth is millions or billions of years old, more like thousands of years old. Now, why would I believe something that might seem so elementary to you? Because the Bible teaches us six literal 24-hour days. Why do you describe fossils and things like that? Well, think about a dinosaur walking upon the earth and The Lord shoots water up from the earth and water down from the earth, and then it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. That's catastrophic. That dinosaur would be buried in mud and rain and wash on top of it. It's very easy for a fossil to form in that time. You don't need millions of years for something like that to happen. The point is the great flood dramatically changed the earth as the Lord used that as an instrument of his judgment. Think about what this is going to do. 
I mean, he says things like the sky is going to change, the mountains will be crushed. Some commentators even believe that this would realign the earth's continents. We don't know, but we have a picture of what the great flood did. Think about this great judgment the Lord's going to bring on and through the sixth seal and what that's going to do to the planet. Then in verses 15 through 17, we see it gets personal here in the sixth seal. We see all people in society experience this. No one is exempt. We see these events send the weak and the powerful into hiding, hoping to do what? Avoid the wrath of God. But it's really interesting in verse 16. They actually recognize the very one who is bringing down this judgment. But it's also even more interesting They still refuse to submit and surrender to him. You know, sometimes we think, oh, if the Lord would just do a miracle here, if he would just do a sign here, if he would just do a wonder here, that person would believe. I don't think so. God works through his spirit and his word to draw people to salvation through his servants. These catastrophic events that they recognize, it was the lamb breaking the seals and sending these on them, they still would not surrender. So with the end of chapter 6, we're actually introduced to another theme as we move on to chapter 7. We've seen the scroll and the sovereign opening the scroll by breaking the seals. But in chapter 7, we have number 4, the saved. Now chapter 7 is literally a dash or parentheses between the 6th and 7th seals. There are interludes in the book of Revelation. They give us a look into heaven. And so just for a moment, Literally, pause is pressed upon judgment, and we get to see another work the Lord is doing. This time, it's not against his enemies upon the earth. It's for his people in his presence in heaven. And we're introduced to two people here that actually make up the one group of the saved for our theme. And the first is the 144,000 in verses 1 through 8. Now, you probably have heard a lot of varied opinions about who the 144,000 are. Maybe you know somebody who is a Jehovah Witness or you've been a Jehovah Witness before. You know that Jehovah Witnesses believe these are the ones that will be reigning with Christ in heaven. If you follow their teachings, then you'll be on paradise here on earth. And then, if not, you'll be cast into hell and annihilated forever. The Bible doesn't teach any of those three things. Some people look at the 144,000 and they go, well, this has got to be a symbolic number of all believers. And that number 12 there is just the fullness of that group. But we got to remember when we look at Scripture, we have to look at context. And context is king to help us understand what's happening here. And look at verse 4. It says, I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. See, from this, it's more likely this is a group of redeemed Jews who were saved and sealed. In other words, protected by God to evangelize and spread the gospel during the tribulation. And so as God saves and seals a group of these Jewish evangelists for his mission, here's what we see. The Jewish people, the nation of Israel, begin to become the witness nation in the tribulation that she refused to be in the Old Testament. Which brings us to the second group of the saved people here in verses 9 through 17. These are the ones who are actually converted by the preaching of the 144,000 as the gospel expands and spreads across the planet. And notice, they believe, but they, like we saw in the fifth seal there, they are martyred and brought into heaven. And John sees a view of this in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. Look at this with me. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. See, God's going to accomplish his mission, his prerogative in the most intense condition. There is not one person, there is not one thing, there is not one circumstance, event that can thwart the plans of God. He does what he pleases, and he pleases to save people in the most intense conditions in the middle of the tribulation. In verse 9, we see he has a people out there, and where are they? They are represented in every nation, and they come to Christ through the ministry of the 144,000 during the tribulation period. And God's going to be their comfort. God's going to be their shelter in heaven compared to the persecution they experienced upon the earth and the horrors that he is pouring out there. 
So we have this saved group here in this interlude, which brings us back to our third point of the seals and to chapter 8. So flip to chapter 8 as we just see briefly the seventh seal. Chapter 8, verse 1 says this, When the Lamb opened the seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. We're not going to look much into the seventh seal because it's going to be set up in later passages as it really launches other things that are going to happen in the book. But here in the seventh seal, you see seven angels. And these seven angels are actually going to blow seven trumpets inside of the seventh seal. And a trumpet was a sound of announcement. And here's the announcement. If you thought judgment was bad before, just wait on the judgment, wrath, and fury that's going to come out from the Lord onto the earth. So the sound of the trumpet with that announcement and judgment, then in turn with that seventh trumpet that's blown, we're going to have the seven bowls of wrath that are poured out. But I want you to notice here in that verse that I read, in verse 1 it says, When Christ breaks the seventh seal, there is silence in heaven for half an hour or so. Why the silence? It is literally a pause of anticipation. They are awestruck at one, who God is being in his presence, but two, what he's about to do with the intensity and the severity of his wrath. The seventh seal judgment is going to intensify in subsequent fashion as that seal is broken, as those angels blow those trumpets, and then those bowls of wrath are poured out. So that brings us to the end here. Not only is the clock running out on time, but also on this message. And so in this sermon, here's what we've seen. We've seen, number one, the scroll. We've seen, number two, the sovereign. We've seen, number three, the seals. Number four, the saved. And then finally and fifthly, let's wrap up with this if you've been taking notes. The significance. I mean, what do you do with the content of a message like this? I mean, what can you literally put in your pocket, walk out and put into practice at home and and work and school and in your community. Here are five significant things for us to consider as we respond to this text. Number one, I would just tell you this, trust the Bible. Trust the Bible. Revelation calls us to trust the sufficiency and the veracity of the word of God. I mean, stop believing all the crackpot prophets that are out there today. They don't know They constantly make predictions and label things in Revelation. And every single time, they are wrong. Let the Bible inform you about what's going to happen with the unfolding of the end of time. If the Bible speaks with specificity towards something, then double down on it. But if not, there's no need to go around trying to guess when Christ is going to return or try to pick out who the Antichrist is or figure out specifics in these seals. No, just trust the Bible. It's okay to listen to other preachers. I listen to a lot of preaching, and I encourage you to do the same. But can I tell you, the very best sermon that I hear every week and the best sermon that you're going to hear every week is from this pulpit. As our pastor stands up and trusts the Bible, teaches us to trust the Bible, because God's appointed him to teach us rightly the Word of God, and he has care over our souls as the under-shepherd to Christ here in this church. Secondly, I would tell you this, the significance is not only to trust the Bible, but to tarry for justice. You know, there's some words that just don't deserve an adjective. Gospel is one of them. The minute you put an adjective in front of gospel, it negates the meaning. Justice is one of those two, and that's been a buzzword today. But here's what I want you to know. Revelation is pointing to a time when true justice will be rendered. Not justice of any mankind making, but I mean biblical justice justice. And just as the saints that we see in this text cried out for justice, we also, we're waiting on God to come and make all things right. We look around and we see all the injustices in the world and as believers, it breaks our hearts. And we know the remedy is the gospel, but Christ coming to make all things right. And so we're in a sense told to wait and rest. He's going to answer it. And just because God's judgment might be delayed does not mean it's going to be denied thirdly i would tell you the significance of a text like this is to think on the lord's full attributes i mean revelation puts on display the glory of god in the fullness of all his characteristics all his attributes so here's what you do you think on those things i mean this is not the meek mild weak puny god that was taught to me 
when I was a young believer through sappy worship songs and shallow devotional books. I mean, this is the same God that I get the chance to commune with, that you get the same chance to commune with through singing in corporate worship with the church body, through reading the word, through sitting under preaching, through praying to him. Remember, when we interact with God, we're interacting with the very one who is going to break these seals and pour out his wrath. And so even though he tenderly receives us in, we must remember the power our Lord has in his hand. Fourthly, I would encourage you to do this, to turn from sin and to Christ. I mean, Revelation shows us there's only two groups of people, the saved and the lost. Those who are dead in sin are those who are alive in Christ. And every person represented in those two groups are only going to go to one of two places. We will all die We will all be judged and then sent eternally into heaven or hell. Now, that's a hard truth. And just because someone doesn't like that truth doesn't change the fact that that's what it is. It is truth. And so let me just ask you, if you've heard this message and you realize you're apart from Christ, would you turn from your sin and would you turn to the Savior so he could apply his blood to your life and save your soul? See, the wrath that will take place in hell honestly is going to make the things that are happening in these seals during the tribulation period look like a walk in the park. See, we deserve the wrath. We do. But, oh, the Lord's great love for us that he would send Jesus and crush him in our place and Christ willingly laying down his life for us out of love to absorb the wrath of God so that we would not have to go experience the wrath of God in a place called hell. And then fifthly, if you are in Christ, I tell you to do this. Tell others of your hope. And hearing a message on the revelation, it should spur us to spread the gospel with urgency. I mean, do you really believe all this stuff? I mean, do I really believe all this stuff is going to take place? And as I mentioned on the onset of this message, we might have some different views that we have on Revelation and to keep that in our minds with our doctrinal construct that we're laying over this text. But the point is, regardless of how you believe this stuff's going to shake out, I bet you believe this. Christ will return, judgment will be rendered, and we will all be ushered into eternity. And if we believe that that's going to happen, and it is, then we must spread the gospel of Jesus Christ with such urgency and fervency in the face of this coming judgment. So wherever you're at right now, I want to encourage you just to bow with me, as if you were sitting in this room. Would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes just to reflect and I want to give you some parting thoughts and questions from this text today. If you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit, the one who oversaw the authorship of the entire scripture and the book of Revelation and the passages we looked at today, he lives inside of you. Would you take just a moment and ask him to lead and guide and direct you of how to respond to this text? What you need to do, areas of disobedience, things you need to confess, things that you need to add on into your relationship in serving Christ. If you're not in Christ, let me just candidly say this. I pray that you're haunted hearing this text. You know, those in Christ, we often think, uh, we look and we see Satan and God battling it out at the end of time. It's not quite like that. God has always been supreme and sovereign over Satan. Even Satan is under his sovereign hand and authority. So I say that to say this. If you are not in Christ, you really don't need to fear Satan. You need to fear the Lord. Because we see that anybody apart from Christ is an enemy of the Lord. We cannot help but reflect upon what he's going to do to his enemies here in this text. But here's the good news. It doesn't have to remain that way. It doesn't have to stay that way. Would you turn from your sin and trust Christ today? Here's a reminder. Revelation chapter 7 verse 10 says, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb.